Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar, Immigration Law, What's New and How LexisNexis Can Help. My name is Ellen Heine, and I will be your host for the presentation. Our speaker today is Stephen Yale Lair. Steve is the Professor of Immigration Law Practice at Cornell Law School, the co-author of Immigration Law and Procedure, and a founding member of the Alliance for Business Immigration Lawyers. Before we begin, I want to direct your attention to the chat box located in the lower right hand of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them there, and Steve will be answering questions for the remaining 15 minutes of the webinar. Handing it over to you, Steve. Great, hello everybody, glad to have you here. We're delighted to talk about the complexity of how Lexis can help you out. Today, we're gonna to discuss three things. First, what every non-immigration lawyer should know about U.S. immigration law. Second, recent changes in U.S. immigration law. And third, how LexisNexis can help you. So let's delve right into it. Over 41 million foreign-born people live in the United States. That's about 15% of the U.S. population. And no matter what kind of law you practice, you may represent someone who is not a U.S. citizen. Immigration law touches all aspects of law, including labor and employment law, family law, corporate law, mergers and acquisitions, criminal law, tax law, trusts and estates, real estate law, litigation, and workers' compensation law. There is an awful lot of overlap between immigration law and other areas of law. Courts have said that immigration law is the second most complicated area of law right after tax law, but here we're going to try to help you out. If your client is not a U.S. citizen, then you probably want to contact an immigration lawyer for help or LexisNexis for doing your research. One way to enter this discussion is to ask where your client was born. If he or she was not born in the United States, they may have immigration issues that affect you representing them. On corporate law, there's a lot going on that interacts with immigration law. U.S. companies are competing with foreign companies for the best and the brightest. A lot of foreign nationals who graduate from colleges, particularly with master's degrees or PhDs, are foreign nationals. A lot of them have so-called STEM degrees, meaning their degree is in science, technology, engineering, or math, and they have special immigration options because of that fact. Also, as a corporate lawyer, you need to know about the fact that all employers need to verify the identity and employment authorization of the people that they hire, whether they're U.S. citizens or foreign nationals. That's known as the I-9 process. And an employer's failure to do that or to do it incorrectly can carry civil or criminal penalties. Just today, the Supreme Court announced in a decision called Kansas versus Garcia that it is okay to use I-9 documentation to try to prove a state law criminal fraud statute. So this I-9 process is very important. When it comes to corporate law, you may represent um, a company that is thinking of hiring a foreign national, and then you need to decide, well, what kind of visa can they use to enter the United States or to stay here? There are lots of different categories. On the right side, you see a lot of letters and numbers. Those come from where these various visa categories are in the immigration statute. And each of them have different requirements. So for example, on the non-immigrant side, a B-1 visa allows someone to come in temporarily uh, for up to six months at a time, but they can't you know, really work in the United States or at least get paid in the United States. You may have heard about the H-1B visa. That's sort of the workhorse of temporary work visa categories, um, but that uh, has limits on it of 85,000 new H-1Bs each year. It's got a time limitation. People typically are not allowed to work more than six years at a time on an H-1B, and it has certain interactions with the Labor Department on the wage issue before you get to the immigration agency. Um, you may represent a foreign entrepreneur who maybe is graduating from a college. Students can get something known as optional practical training after they graduate from college on an F-1 visa but there are limitations to that. So it can be difficult for them to be able to do what they want to do. On the left side of the screen, we've got something known as immigrant visas or permanent visas. And there are different kinds of employment-based green cards. Um, and each one has its own requirements and backlogs. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Mergers and acquisitions are also important. 
um, because of per immigrants' status is job and employer specific. Sometimes, for example, if someone's working on a temporary H-1B visa, uh, they may have to change that visa if the company is acquired or merges with somebody else. Also, maybe somebody is here on an E visa, and that may ch person may fall out of status if the company is sold to people from a country that doesn't have an E visa treaty with the United States. Or an L1 intra-company transferee may fall out of status because he or she did not work for the acquiring company for a year before being transferred to the United States. You also have to consider procedural issues and delays that come up in immigration cases. There could be a delay in getting the documentation together. Uh, perhaps the job offer is not specific enough to satisfy the immigration agency. Sometimes employers do not understand the rules or employees do not understand the rules. There can also be issues or complications with family members. Even if someone qualifies uh, substantively for a visa category, there are various grounds of inadmissibility that prevent them or their family members from coming to the United States. So perhaps your client qualifies for an H-1B visa, but maybe they were convicted of shoplifting or other crimes overseas. That may prevent them from coming into the United States. There are also medical conditions, uh, immigration fraud issues, and recently new rules that limit uh, what kinds of government benefits uh, foreign nationals can receive and work in the United States. You need to know that as a corporate lawyer that represents either an employer who's hiring a foreign national or a foreign national employee. On tax law, uh, there's a common misperception that if I live in the United States for less than half of each year, I do not have to pay U.S. taxes. That is true for some, but not all, non-immigrants, and that's NIV holders, and certainly for people who have green cards, meaning they're lawful permanent residents, they do have to report their uh, income, worldwide income, to the United States, even if they live outside the United States all year. There are complicated tax rules that affect immigrants. If you've been in the United States for a total of at least 183 weighted days during the prior three years in the U.S., then you are a tax resident, even though you may not be a green card holder. But there are exceptions for governmental employees and other professionals and students. On the family law side, there can be complications if your client is not a U.S. citizen. For example, many undocumented immigrants are, are under increasing threats of deportation, so we need to figure out how their U.S.-born children will be taken care of if the parents are taken into custody or deported. Perhaps you represent someone who wants to do an international adoption. There are certain rules there, particularly if the country is covered by the Hague Convention on International Adoptions. Sometimes you have uh, parents who will need to file affidavits of support if someone is subject to a new public charge rule. Sometimes someone may qualify for a special kind of green card called special, even, special immigrant juvenile status, and that can have immigration consequences for family lawyers as well too because they first need to go to family court to prove that they have been abandoned by their parents. On the criminal law side, under a Supreme Court case known as Padilla versus Kentucky, decided in 2010, Criminal lawyers must discuss the immigration consequences of a crime before advising the client to plead guilty. Otherwise, that might be a violation of the Sixth Amendment as ineffective assistance of counsel and could also lead to a malpractice charge against you, the criminal lawyer. So anytime you represent a client who's been charged with a crime who is not a U.S. citizen, you want to consult with an immigration lawyer about the possible immigration consequences for your client. For example, you may think that by pleading to a lesser crime where they do not have to serve jail time, you're doing the best possible thing for your client. And that may be true from a criminal law perspective, but not necessarily from an immigration law perspective. In particular, you need to watch out for certain kinds of crimes, crimes involving moral turpitude, and that is not defined in the immigration statute, but it does basically involve crimes that involve evil intent like assault, for example. Um, aggravated felonies are defined in the immigration statute, uh, and they include certain serious crimes such as murder or rape or sexual abuse of a minor, drug trafficking, et cetera, but they also include some things that are misdemeanors, 
So you may be representing someone and have them plead to a misdemeanor that it turns out to be an aggravated felony for immigration purposes. And certainly any crime that involves drugs or domestic violence may have immigration consequences as well. In the civil litigation context, um, sometimes there are issues that come up as to whether a person's immigration status is discoverable. Some courts will authorize the discovery of passport visa and then past visas where the immigration status is important. Immigration status can also be a factor in calculating lost wages damages. Um, but many courts have said that in the workers' compensation area, at least, that lost wages are not limited by a person's immigration status. On the employment law side, generally case law holds that employers' statements made in a visa petition or general claims to obtain a green card do not create an enforceable contract. But how do you make sure that is clear? You might recommend if you represent an employer that they have new employees sign a waiver form uh, that can reinforce the understanding that the employee's employment and compensation can be terminated with or without cause and without regard to their visa status. However, if a person is an H-1B worker, those rules require that the employer must agree to pay the reasonable cost of returning the employee to their home country. So you need to be careful in this area. In labor law and workers' compensation areas, there's a case called Hoffman Plastics versus NLRB, a 2002 Supreme Court decision that ruled that an undocumented worker was not eligible to receive back pay under the National Labor Relations Act, even when the worker's termination was an unfair labor practice because to grant such a remedy would contravene the policies behind our immigration law. But courts have generally limited Hoffman Plastics to the National Labor Relations Act context. Courts have allowed undocumented workers to sue and to get damages in other areas, such as workers' compensation, Fair Labor Standards Act for overtime. So, for example, the Eighth Circuit has held that employers cannot exploit undocumented workers' status in violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Also, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prevents national origin discrimination. And that law has been held to apply to undocumented immigrants as well. In the real estate context, um, foreign nationals can purchase property, but there are issues that can come up as to whether there are minimum amounts on the deposit or loan limits, whether they need to have a social security card and what to do if the foreign national does not have a social security card. Sometimes banks will get confused between people who have visas and those who have status but do not have visas, such as Canadians. And that can cause problems in real estate transactions. In the trust and estate area, foreign status doesn't necessarily exempt an individual from estate tax, but it can limit the marital deduction. The US spouse, for example, may want to put assets into a qualifying domestic trust, a, a QDOT, whereas the foreign spouse may want to use a qualified terminal interest property trust or a Q-tip. And there's more information on the slide here about trying to understand that difference. The bottom line, if you are not an immigration lawyer, is that if you are working with a foreign national or an employer that wants to hire a foreign national, you need to find out the foreign national's immigration status. If you are unclear uh, whether they are a US citizen, ask them where they were born and what their status is. And if you are unclear whether their immigration status may impact what your client's trying to do, consult with an immigration lawyer or use LexisNexis to research the issue. Part two of the presentation, recent changes in US immigration law. The themes for this part of the presentation are number one, it's always been hard to navigate our immigration system. The United States has the largest and most complex immigration system in the world. But our immigration system is broken. But even though it is broken, some people do manage to immigrate legally. This administration has not persuaded Congress to build a physical wall along the US-Mexico border, but it has effectively created an invisible wall to restrict legal immigration. But Lexis can help you navigate the complexity of US immigration law and recent changes. The US immigration system is the largest immigration system in the world. 
10 million people more or less enter the United States temporarily each year, whether it's to study, be a tourist, or to work in the United States. Another 500,000 to a million people a year get so-called green cards and therefore become immigrants. Generally, people who come into the United States often start on non, as non-immigrants, coming temporarily, and that's the red screen there. Um, those people generally can stay only for a limited amount of time uh, and can work or not work depending on the categories. That's the starting point for a lot of people. Then if they want to stay here permanently, they go to the gray, this, the black area called permanent residence, but it can be a long and difficult process. But once you become a permanent resident or a green card holder, you can live or work anywhere in the United States, but you cannot vote. And you can be deported if you uh, commit certain crimes or other infractions of our U.S. immigration system. Then if you be, have a green card and want to become a naturalized U.S. citizen, you can do so by going through the naturalization process. Um, and that usually takes three to five years after someone gets a green card. <clears throat> Once you become a naturalized U.S. citizen, you can live or work anywhere, you can vote in U.S. elections, and you do not have to fear about being deported. But that does not cover everyone who's a foreign national. The gray area at the top of the screen are people who are here in some sort of either undocumented status or quasi-documented status called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or Temporary Protected Status. And about 10 million people in the United States have that kind of status. For non-immigrants, people coming temporarily, uh, I basically put them into three types of categories, those that allow work, those that do not allow work, and those that are special cases. Again, these letters and numbers come from where they are in 8 U.S.C. section uh, 1101, and we immigration lawyers try to remember them. A1, for example, we call ambassadors because they're for diplomats. We go all the way down to V visas, I particularly like the S visa. I call that the sneaky snitch visa. Um, so some people who are here as non-immigrants can work. Others cannot work. Those who can work, again, typically can only work for a certain amount of time. Um, and some people, like the F1 students, can work on campus while they're going to school, can work off campus while they're graduating, sorry, before they graduate during the summer, for example and then can work for one to three years after they graduate, and that's where the employers come in. All immigrants or non-immigrants have to be screened before they come into the United States, and we've been doing that since the 1880s. If people want to be here permanently, uh, there are basically four ways that they can do so. Family-sponsored, employment-based, humanitarian, what I call bad luck. Bad luck happens to you and you feel persecuted, so you can come to the United States or a diversity lottery, which is 50000 a year, which I call good luck. It's actually a lottery and allows people to come to the United States. These categories uh, include the family members. So we have 140,000 people a year who get employment-based green cards, but that is not 140,000 workers. That includes their family members as well, too. These numbers and the percentages change a little bit from year to year, but overall, about two-thirds of all people immigrate to the United States based on family characteristics, about 15% based on employment, 15% based on humanitarian, and 5% for diversity. So you see that our immigration system is skewed toward family-based immigration. That makes sense because we do not want to break up families. Also, family members work, and employment-related immigrants bring their families. If you do get a green card, um, and this is what it looks like. It's actually not green anymore. It's turned out to be uh, white, but they are salmon colored with holograms and high tech counterfeit resistance features, more counterfeit resistant than your driver's license. After someone becomes a green card holder, if they want to become a naturalized US citizen, they have to wait another three to five years. And over 750,000 people a year go through the naturalization process. I just met someone from India. It took him 22 years from entering the United States as a student until he finally became a U.S. citizen. So patience is not just a virtue. It's a requirement in U.S. immigration law even to do everything legally.
So, so far this sounds fine, but there are long backlogs in the legal immigration system because of numerical limits on the number of people who can immigrate in most categories. So here we have the family-based green card categories. F1 refers to unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. citizens, that's 23,000. F2A is for spouses and children of green card holders. F2B are unmarried sons and daughters of green card holders. F3 is for married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. And F4 are brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. And that gets 65,000 just for that category alone. So 65,000 sounds like a lot of brothers and sisters, but because of backlogs that have developed over the years, it can be a long time. So for example, if you look at the bottom right corner of the chart for Philippines fourth preference, the backlog is December 1999. That means that a brother or sister of a U.S. citizen who is from the Philippines, who started the process 21 years ago, is now only able to finally immigrate to the United States. Some people complain about chain migration, but this shows chain migration doesn't really happen. We also have backlogs in the employment-based side. So if you're a doctor from India, for example, you may have to wait um, five years or longer to be able to get a green card. Our immigration system is made more complicated because we do not have one agency dealing with immigration. We have three branches of the Department of Homeland Security, plus the State Department, plus the Labor Department, plus the Department of Home, HHS, Health and Human Services. And these different agencies don't necessarily talk with each other very well. So we have a broken system. Employers cannot hire the help that they want. For example, we have to have a lottery for the H-1B program because too many employers want to get, try to get access to the 85,000 new H-1Bs each year. In some industries, in, uh, employers cannot find enough U.S. workers. For example, over half of all farm workers in the United States are undocumented. They are at risk of getting picked up and put into deportation. We also have a broken immigration court system. We do not have enough immigration judges. It takes two years on average for an immigrant to have a hearing before an immigration judge. There are 460 immigration judges with a backlog of over 1 million cases. So if you do the math, that's over 3,000 cases per judge, many of them doing, involving asylum, which involves uh, life or death consequences. Everyone knows that our immigration system is broken, but so far it's been impossible for Congress to fix the system. Congress came close in 2013 when the Senate passed a 1,200-page bill, but the House of Representatives failed to take up the bill. Now it's unlikely that we'll get any immigration legislation until after the presidential election. Because of Congress's inability to pass immigration reform legislation, President Obama used his administrative party powers in 2012 to start deferred action for childhood arrivals. The Trump administration wants to terminate the program, and the Supreme Court will decide by this June whether the current administration has the legal authority to terminate the DACA program. Over 700,000 people have DACA status, many of them working now for Fortune 500 companies. When this administration came in, they announced a whole series of recent immigration executive orders and announcements, and this is just some of them. Going into more detail on some of them, uh, increased enforcement at the border. Uh, the administration is trying to build a wall to stop people from entering the United States. They also expanded something known as expedited removal, so that people who have just entered the United States can be deported quickly. Just yesterday in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court heard oral argument as to whether someone subject to expedited removal has a constitutional right to a habeas corpus proceeding. And we'll hear the decision in that by the June, uh, end of June this year. Interior enforcement. Before we used to prioritize going after criminal aliens. Under this administration, everyone is now a target for being picked up and being detained been a 41% increase in the number of undocumented immigrants who are now being arrested. We also have increased employer sanctions uh, for employers who are not going through the I-9 process correctly. There's triple the number of employer audits this year compared to prior administrations. This administration is also trying to terminate 
the Temporary Protected Status Program, known as TPS. And that's the program that allows the gov U.S. government to designate foreign nationals in the United States to remain here safely during a temporary problem overseas, such as civil war, earthquake, or hurricane. And right now, the immigration uh, agency is trying to terminate TPS for five countries that affect over 320,000 people. Um, but that is also subject to litigation, and we'll see what happens in that. On the travel ban and refugee restrictions, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the third travel ban, and, but um, it remains to be seen whether other travel bans, like one that was in introduced on February of this year, uh, is going to be legal as well, too. There have also been a number of asylum restrictions. Um, Asylum is an international obligation, and it's also under our U.S. immigration law. It's always been difficult to win asylum, but this administration has issued new directives that make it more difficult for family members and victims of domestic violence and gang activity to win asylum. Many asylum applicants are forced to wait in Mexico for their immigration court hearings. And just last Friday in the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit ruled that this remain in Mexico policy is illegal. So we'll see what happens next. Family separation is another issue, um, and that's caused a lot of consternation and litigation. Public charge is a new one that's just come up. The concept of public charge has existed since the 1880s. It's been used to deny entry and green cards to those who primarily depend on government assistance to survive. Until this year, we basically limited the worries about public charge to people who received cash benefits. Under this administration, they've expanded the concept of public charge to include non-cash benefits like Medicaid, food stamps, and housing programs. Um, and so that's now a new concern. And that was delayed until February 24th, but the Supreme Court let the rule go forward. So as of last week, everyone needs to worry about that as well, too. Another new item is the H-1B registration system. Because of the lottery, the immigration agency now has set up a new registration system to determine who can even apply uh, to get an H-1B visa. There's also new restrictions at uh, the southern border. Uh, there's a ban on asylum if you did not apply in another country first. Um, and there are new agreements to return asylum seekers to their home countries. Another new development is the USMCA, which is basically the new version of the NAFTA agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Uh, the immigration provisions in that remain unchanged, but the new version affects things like intellectual property and dairy products. So there's certainly a lot of changes to immigration law. The question is, how can LexisNexis help you navigate this complexity? This slide shows you our Lexis Immigration Practice Center, where Lexis has put together all of the different kinds of immigration materials into one area to make it easy for you to find what you are looking for. There's certainly a lot to look at. Uh, there are the statutes relevant to U.S. immigration law that are codified in 8, 18, 22, 29, and 42 of the U.S. Code. There are the Code of Federal Regulations relevant to immigration. There are analytical treatises and guides like the Immigration Law and Procedure Treatise. There are forms in, at Lexis. There are immigration cases, both at the federal and agency levels. Federal Register materials. Uh, there are internal agency guidelines like the U.S. State Department Foreign Affairs Manual or the USCIS Policy Manual, Department of Labor Office of Foreign Labor Certification, FAQs. There's human rights materials. There's immigration news sources. So Lexis has it all and has organized it in a practice center where with one screen you can find basically everything that you want. This is a picture of the treatise that I co-author called Immigration Law and Procedure. Um, it basically is 21 volumes and it is the most comprehensive treatise on U.S. immigration law. It's the most cited treatise by U.S. courts with citations in almost 500 U.S. court decisions including 20 Supreme Court decisions, including the Padilla versus Kentucky case that I mentioned before. In addition to the treatise, 
There's also a lot of other fast-breaking development kinds of information on Lexis. So, for example, Lexis has something called Bender's Immigration Bulletin that comes out twice a month that wraps up all the immigration news in two-week increments and is cross-referenced to the Immigration Law and Procedure Treatise. Lexis also has something called Bender's Immigration Regulation Service that's updated every month depending on regulations that come out. There's also Bender's Immigration and Nationality Act service that's updated after every time that Congress passes something related to immigration as a statute. This is a picture of the Immigration Law Practice Expediter. This is something that Lexis has put together. It's a kind of practice guide roadmap that leads the user through immigration procedures in a step-by-step manner while providing links to the Immigration Law and Procedure Treatise, immigration statutes, regulations, forms, and other source materials. Using this expediter saves attorneys and paralegals times and assures users that no element in the research process will be overlooked. This is the screenshot of the practice expediter for H-1B petitions, but the expediter has a lot of other exp uh, practice areas too, and you see them down at the bottom of the screen in terms of family-sponsored visa petitions, uh, employment-based green cards, the PERM labor certification. There are about 20 different expediters, so they can really help a new person understand how to practice this area. Lexis also has a free daily immigration newsroom so that you can stay on top of daily immigration updates. Just type in your internet BIB, it stands for Bender's Immigration Bulletin Daily. So BIBDaily.com, and it'll take you to this screen where you can sign up to get notified via email, uh, either daily or weekly, about all the recent immigration law statuses. So anytime anything happens on the courts or in the news or regulations or statutes, it's right here first on BIBDaily.com, which is a free service from Lexis. Lexis also has free YouTube training to learn how to research immigration law more effectively. Just go to YouTube and type in Immigration on Lexis Advance, and you'll go to this video, which is a four-minute video packed with step-by-step -step navigation of Lexis's great resources for researching immigration law. So with that, I want to stop so we have time for some questions. If I can't get to your questions today, you can email me at swy1 at cornell.edu if you have any specific immigration law questions or if you want to learn how to use Lexis's immigration materials more effectively. You can also go to Lexis Advance and ask the experts there for advice as well too. With that, we'll stop and we can start with some questions. Now, is not from one of the countries. Um, let me go back to that slide and show you. There we go. Um, so this is from something called the State Department's Visa Bulletin, and they come out every month with questions, uh, with status of how long it takes to get a certain kind of green card. On the left is the categories. There are five different types of employment-based green card categories. EB1 uh, is for people who have extraordinary ability or multinational um, executives or managers or outstanding professors and researchers. And you'll see that their first column next to that is all chargeability areas except those listed. Um, and then we have uh, more backlogs for certain countries, China, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, India, Mexico, and the Philippines. So the question is, what is the backlog for EB2 um, if the immigrant is not from one of the specified countries? So for EB2, we see that it's the, the answer is C, which means current, which means it is not backlogged. It certainly takes a certain amount of time to go through the petition process with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services before a person can be scheduled to get an immigrant visa appointment at their embassy overseas. But the C means that there is no backlog once you reach that point in the process. For EB3, 
um, the backlog is January of 2017. So that's about a three-year backlog. EB3 are for people who are professionals, people who have at least bachelor's degrees, and EB2 is for people who have advanced degrees. So for each of these categories, you need to figure out where your client fits in, not only substantively in terms of which category, but also what country they're from so that you can properly advise them on how long the backlog may be for them. Another question that came in is, um, how do I keep up to date with all the recent immigration developments? Well, there are a lot of different ways. You can certainly um, do a Google alert on immigration. But going back to this one slide for BIB uh, daily, um, this one is an email that goes, about, uh, goes out about 3 o'clock Eastern time each day with all of the 24 hours news about immigration law. It's a great resource. It has things that you would expect to be there, like Supreme Court decisions, but it also has commentary. Um, it has unpublished decisions by immigration judges and the Board of Immigration Appeals. It has analysis by experts. Um, and you can either browse what's on there or you can do a search. And so I often uh, will look for unpublished decisions on this resource because it often is not uh, it's something you cannot find anywhere else. Somebody asked about H-1B registration. Let me go back to that slide and back up. On H-1Bs, uh, the law, uh, which has not been changed for many years, limits the number of new H-1B visas each year to about 85,000. There are some exceptions. For example, if you're working for a university, you don't, are not subject to that cap. But for most private employers, you are subject to that 85,000 cap. Uh, when Congress passed that legislation about 20 years ago, 85,000 visas a year sounded like a lot. But over the years, it really has not been en enough. And so, uh, the immigration agency has been forced to have a lottery where employers would put in a full petition and hope that their petition got selected in the lottery. Last year, for example, about 200,000 employers filed petitions, which meant that there was about a one in three chance of getting selected through the lottery. This year, the immigration agency has tried to make things uh, simpler for employers by saying, we're going to let people pre-register and just put in sort of an expression of interest that you want to file an H-1B petition, but you will not do so unless you're actually selected in the lottery. So for this month of March, um, people are pre-registering on the USCIS website and saying, yes, I want to file an H-1B petition. It costs $10. The registration process started um, um, on Sunday, March 1st, but there have been glitches in the computer system. I've got some immigration lawyer friends who have been complaining on emails about the fact that the system is down and they cannot register their employer's interest. What the immigration agency will do is um, decide among all the registrants who then is actually selected and then allow 85,000 of those people to file petitions. So it sort of removes the angst of whether you're going to be selected because you'll know by April 1st whether at least you can file. Now, filing does not mean that the petition will be approved. Denial rates for H-1B petitions have increased significantly in the last couple of years as the immigration agency has become more stringent in figuring out whether someone qualifies for H-1B status or whether they violated their student status before. But at least the registration process is intended to make it a little easier for employers. But so far in the first few days of March, it's only been more complicated because their registration computer system has too many glitches. Another question that has come in um, concerns, um, you know, what if I want to do a pro bono case for an immigrant? How can I learn how to do that. And there are a variety of ways. Um, 
I would check first with a bar association in your particular city or state. Many times uh, bar associations have immigration sections and they'll put on seminars about training people how to take on pro bono cases. In some big cities um, like Washington or New York or Los Angeles, um, you have either bar associations or human rights groups that will train lawyers on how to do pro bono asylum cases or deportation proceedings. In New York City, for example, Human Rights First has an excellent training program where they train lawyers at big law firms how to do pro bono asylum cases. The American Immigration Lawyers Association works with the American Immigration Council as well, too, to uh, identify compelling cases and then provides mentorship for people who are not familiar with immigration law to be able to take on those cases. Um, so the variety of ways that uh, people can take on a pro bono case even if they are not an immigration lawyer. Many people find uh, immigration to be very rewarding because you're helping a child or an immigrant who's fleeing persecution to be able to stay in the United States. And many times these people uh, don't have access to a lawyer, so someone who can represent them pro bono makes a huge difference. For example, there's an organization called KIND, Kids in Need of Defense. And if you go to kindsupport.org, I think is the URL, uh, they pair immigration lawyers at big law firms with training mechanisms so that they can take on particularly challenging cases such as representing children uh, in immigration proceedings. Another question that has come in is, uh, you know, people ask, well, I'm a non-immigration lawyer, and you say in the webinar that you should work with good immigration lawyers on various types of cases. How do I find a good immigration lawyer in my area? Um, that's a good question. Um, again, you can start with your local bar association. Many times they have sections, and you can determine who's in the immigration section of your local bar. Um, there's also a National Immigration Lawyers Association called the American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA. And if you go to AILA.org, uh, you can find out you know, who the immigration lawyers are in your area. And the AILA website allows you to pinpoint not just who are the immigration lawyers, but which of them specialize in business cases or deportation cases or criminal cases. So you can find out. Uh, which ones are, are seem to be good in your area and contact them and then you can feel them out to see if they can help you on your particular case. I think we have time for one more question um, and that's more of a policy question that came in and that is do you think immigration law will change back to where it was before if a new president is elected? And the answer to that is no. Um, I think that this administration has made immigration law even more complex than it used to be. And I think it'll take time to undo some of the things that this administration has done. And it'll take time to change the bureaucrats' feelings about whether a case should be approved or denied. So I think we're in for a long haul, even if we do get a new president, about the complexity of immigration law. The good part about that is that Lexis is dedicated to providing a lot of resources to people to be able to allow them to both understand and if want to be to practice immigration law. And so again, if you have any questions, contact Lexis um, or contact me at SWY1 at cornell.edu. With that, we're at the end at 2.45 and I thank you very much for your time today.